Hello and welcome to Business Analytics Lecture 1. Today we are going to make an introduction. So, as you may know, as you might realize, there is a lot of data these days. A lot of data are being collected, processed by businesses, by research institutions, and a lot of different places. Now, why is there more data now? So why do we talk about data a lot more these days than we did, let's say, 20 years ago? Well, there are three main reasons for that, okay? So one of them can be attributed to technological advances. So things like scanner technology, e-commerce being done a lot these days due to COVID, the internet, social networks, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, personal devices, your computers, laptops, mobile phones, more important than anything else. So the, these, the, the growth in the, all these things um, have led to more data collection, all right? And the second one is, of course, the advancement in the technology, um, the techniques and methodologies that do data processing for us, right? So different, um, different uh, models, different machine learning models, data mining techniques, etc. Um, they are now more efficient than before. They are faster than before, and they are now more capable to handle much larger data than before. Okay, and the third one, we can name them as being um, the development in the computer hardware itself. So things like, you know, better processors, much larger RAMs than before, parallel computing, cloud computing, etc. So all these things combined together has led to the exponential growth of data and data processing in um, in these times. All right, so. Now let's continue to decision making. So what what is decision making? So it's the um, it's the process of to make strategic, tactical, and operational decisions, right? So these are the three main different types of decision making in businesses. Strategic decisions um, they they really draw the big picture. Okay, it's the big the big pieces put together. Okay, higher level issues and um, the overall direction of the organization, the overall goals and aspiration of what they want to achieve. Okay. So um, at this level, it, it's for strategic decisions, the, the higher level management don't care about the very small details. They really draw the big picture to where they want to be next year. Um, these are generally um, annual. You know, there's also, um, of course, longer period strategic decisions uh, like five year and 10 year goals but they really don't delve into the small details. Now, when we go to the tactical decisions, that's really the concern of the mid-level management, right? And they, at this level now, they try to achieve those goals as set forth by, by the strategic decision makers, okay? The strategic decisions are generally made by the CEOs and the C-level executives. And now, uh, the way those things are going to be accomplished, now that's up to this level, okay? So things like, okay, let's say at the strategic level, let's say a 10% growth is being wanted, but how do you achieve that? Do you open new stores? Do you increase your advertisement budget? And, and things like that. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but, but I think you get the big picture. And then, of course, now this is mid-level. As you can imagine, um, again, not very small details are being delved into here. So that is being done at the operational decision level. So this is basically dealing with how to run the firm day to day. Okay. So these are uh, done by operations managers. So these can be the store managers. These can be the um, people at, you know, at the city level or maybe a region level. So these are uh going to be concerned with much smaller details again the big picture is set forth by the strategic level and all these um all the, all the decisions that are done by operational level are actually really trying to achieve that goal set forth by the strategic decision makers <clears throat> so decision making um so those three are the different types of decisions or different levels, you can say. Now, how do we make, uh, how, you know, what is decision making itself? So, first of all, we identify and define a problem, right? 
and then determine the criteria that will be used to evaluate alternative solutions. So once you identify the problem, you need to find different solutions for that, um, assuming there can be different solutions. In order to, for you to identify different solutions and to evaluate them, you also have to have criteria for them. Okay, and that's what this what this um, you know two is saying here. Um, and then at the end, so once you have the criteria and once you have identified those solutions, you can you can uh, evaluate them, and at the end you will choose one alternative. So if I were to give an example for this, um, let's see. So you know we don't even need to go to a um, to a company level. You can just um, think of yourself, let's say you want to buy a computer, right? Um, and now you have different constraints or and also different um, um, criteria. So you might say, okay, I want a computer. Let's say, is it, you know, the first thing you might, you probably want to decide is do you want a laptop or a desktop computer? Um, do you want a Windows PC or a Mac computer? So these are all decisions you need to make. Um, you need to decide on your budget. So what's your budget? So if you want a Mac computer, um, those are generally, you know, uh, more expensive than Windows based computers. So and if you have only a budget of, I don't know, uh, let's say $500, uh, probably you won't be able to buy a Mac computer at least, um, at least if it isn't, you know, if, if, if you want to buy a non used computer. So, so you see, these are your criteria. And also within the, you know, for the computer itself, you might have different criteria. So is it a, you know, if you go with the laptop computer, do you want a 15.6 inch? Do you want a 13 inch? Do you want a, um, you know, what's your screen resolution? What do you want on that? So there is 4K resolution computers. There's um, 1080p computers. There is lower than that. Are you okay with anything or do you have some certain criteria for that? For example, for me, I wouldn't go below 1080p. That would be the absolute lowest for me. Um, I don't like anything lower than that. Um, keyboard being lit is also important for me. So these are my criteria. You might have different things there. So what's the size of the storage? I'd rather prefer larger ones because, you know, I've got a lot of files and pictures and, and whatnot. So um, I, I could not make it with a smaller size storage. So at the end, once you specify your criteria, then you can look at different alternative solutions, right? And at the end, you have, let's say you have identified four different laptops that you really liked. They are, you know, within your criteria. Uh, they have different costs probably. And now at the end, you can make a decision saying, okay, among these, I'm either, you know, I'm fine with all of them. I will just choose, let's say, the one that has the least cost. So that's one way of choosing an alternative, right? So now similar decisions are being made by the comp companies as, uh, as well. Also this... Um, since we are now talking about like business analytics, um, in, in data science, in data analytics, there is, let's say you are trying to solve a problem, right? You are trying to create a predictive, predictive model that can predict, let's say the housing prices. Um, you can achieve this through different methodologies, different techniques. Now at the end, what's your criteria? Which one are you going to select? Are you going to select a model that gives you the best accuracy? Or are you going to give the model that maybe runs the fastest um, also within the accuracy, there's like different types of accuracy. So there's just the, um, accuracy itself. There's also like, um, sensitivity, recall, precision, and different kinds of things that we might go in a little bit into more detail later on in the class. But so in, in everyday life, there's always different, um, you know, solutions to a problem. But which solution you will choose will really depend on what type of criteria you set forth to begin with. And based on that criteria, okay, you, you will you will choose one at the very end. All right. So common approaches to making decisions include tradition. Probably this is one of the most common ones, intuition. So these things are really have experience on that or your friend has an experience or whomever. And then you listen to him or her. And you trust that person, for example, because he has got a lot of um, experience in that. And actually intuition, really, maybe we can change that with um, experience as well here. If intuition is just, you know, just a rather, you know, just a gut feeling that doesn't really make sense. But if it depends on the experience of that person, 
you probably have more trust in that. Rules of thumb, so you can achieve some um, some very simple ideas saying, okay, when this happens, I will act like this, or under this circumstance, I will do this. So some uh, really simple, um, um, uh, you know, criteria to follow. And of course, the best one is the relevant data. So when you are following data, that means you are doing a data driven uh, you're applying a data-driven decision making. So this is not very common these days. It's becoming more and more common due to you know all this data being more uh, accessible and the growth of data. And that's what we are trying to learn in this class. Uh, ultimately, we want to see how and learn how data can be used in businesses so that the business itself can you know follow these data in order to become more efficient, produce more reliable products become more effective and uh, more profitable and whatnot. So that uh, brings us to business analytics and what is business analytics? Um, the scientific process of transforming data into insight. Okay. We are transforming data into insight. And why are we doing that for making better decisions? So Really, when you look, when we talk about data, data is just, you know, it, overall in a very simple form. Data is just like columns and rows, okay? So each row is an observation, okay? And each column is a different attribute, a different feature. So let's say um, you are observing people here. Okay, so each person is, you know, this is John, this is Mary, this is... Michael and so on. And so here you uh, you observe the different attributes of those people. So it's like age, I don't know, income, education, the different movies they like they have watched, the different movies, um, and, and the ratings they have given to the to the those movies and so on. So when you have like thousands and thousands of rows like this, it's really just a bunch of numbers. You can't you can't make use of that. Okay. Data in itself is actually useless. What makes data very useful is making, basically taking this data and transforming it into something, an information, okay? So you take data, you convert it, that to information. So out of this example, if you go from here, the people watch movies, all right? And you might have heard about this recommendation engines or recommender systems that's being used a lot by, you know, Netflix and Amazon and whatnot. So what these things do is really analyzing all these people, their behavior, the, the things they have done in the past, in the movies they have watched, their ratings. And based on that, they come up with recommend, recommending that person a specific movie at a specific time, right? So, um, so when you go to those uh, companies, the Netflix website, for example, it will say, okay, you know, it will come up with several recommendations to you. So the those recommendations are not just randomly chosen movies they are they are based on your past behavior and also the past behavior of people similar to you so that's in in a nutshell that's called the recommendation the recommendation system but now you out of all that data you now have maybe just a small a few uh, a few movie names here being listed to you and among those you can choose one all right so if this data was all being collected and if they were sitting there it's really useless. Only if it is transformed into something useful, then it becomes very, um, very beneficial. So think of it this way. You have um, in your home, you have a big, um, what's it called? A bookshelf with all the books here, hundreds of them, right? You have hundreds of books, but you don't read any of them. So what's the use of having all these books if you don't read any of them? They're just occupying space, they are collecting dust, um, and probably in the future they will end up in a trash bin or maybe we'll just donate them to a library. So they are not useful at all They, if they are just sitting there. If you read them, okay. If you read them, they are useful, right? That's the same thing for data. Data, okay, it's through different techniques like visualization, analysis, machine learning, predictive modeling, prescriptive modeling, whatever, all those things, data becomes useful. All right. Okay. 
um, the tools of business analytics can aid decision making. So how does it aid decision making? By creating insights from data. We already talked about this for quite a while now. Improving our ability to more accurately forecast planning. Yes. Helping us quantify risk. Okay, so quantify risk, that's also very important for businesses. Why? Because um, when they, especially this is valid for new products or new markets, when they are entering a new market or coming up to the market with a new product, they want to know, okay, how much is the potential of this thing being sold? How much is, is the potential of this thing being, you know, not uh, being demanded at all and the company ending up in a, in, a, in a loss? So how much should we invest in it? What should the price of this item be? Um, there's a lot of marketing research and whatnot going into this. And the risk basically is related to, okay, um, instead of coming up with a single number saying, okay, okay, this year you will sell 100,000 items of this product. Okay, those analyzers, the business analysts, come up with a, um, a bit more um, probabilistic solution to it, saying, okay, you might sell between, I don't know, 80 to 120,000 with a 70% probability. Okay, but you also might end up selling, uh, I don't know, less than 30,000 with 20% probability. So all those things, that's quantifying risk. And management now, those CEOs, the C-level guys, they will now, okay, based on this, let's say, um, you know, they, they can decide how to proceed on, on it. And yielding better alternatives through analysis and optimization. So, um, right, so the management might have given a decision, but based on your data-driven solution, they actually might change their course of behavior. They might say, okay, let's change it, let's do something else. That's the benefit of data in business models. Okay, so now we are going to go over the main three types of analytics. Okay, you see here those three types already listed. Descriptive, prescript, uh, predictive, and prescriptive modeling or analytics. So in descriptive analytics, you really want to define the current situation of what's going on. Okay, so what's my current situation? What has happened basically? Okay, you collected data throughout some time and then what has happened during that time. So it basically shedding a light on what has happened in the past and you know if it is very current you can also say okay currently this is what's happening and then based on that you are trying to get a synopsis of of the current situation and this will be used in the next phase which is predictive modeling so that you can try to predict what will happen next so things like data queries reports descriptive statistics visualization data mining techniques basic what-if spreadsheet models. Um, all these things are, are being heavily used in, in businesses now, especially visualization, right? It's one of the uh, most useful techniques to do because, you know, one one picture is worth a thousand words. And, and that's, a, that's a real thing because, um, as I said, when you have large amounts of data, just the data itself is not really useful. You can't really make sense out of it by just looking at numbers. But once you convert that into a graph that looks like this, okay, now you start seeing a pattern there. Now you start seeing, okay, there is some trend there. There's some increase there. Um, so that's, that's, the, um, that's the benefit of visualization. And we will look into visualization quite a bit in this class. Um, so data query is, is uh, the, the meaning of data query is a request for information with certain characteristics from a database. So this is really, um, in short, you know, you might have heard this term SQL. Um, so when you have a lot of data, they are being stored in databases and there are ways to get data. So you can say, okay, give me all the rows where people have an age between, I don't know, 20 and 30. So then it will filter out all those rows and, and give it to you. So this is um, about databases and, and SQL techniques. So another um, thing that's really useful about descriptive analytics is data dashboards. So it's what the, the meaning of data dashboards is basically just a collection of tables, charts, maps, summary statistics. And these are updated as new data becomes available. So this is really useful because um, out of all those data points, Okay, you create a nice dashboard. It not only reveals what's what has happened in the past, 
what's happening now, but also when new data comes into the database, as long as you have set it up that way, it can query those new data into the dashboard and then update the charts, update the tables, update those summary statistics in the maps and whatnot, whatever you have in the dashboard, so that you know the manager who is checking that or you yourself will have a very, um, very good feeling of what's going on with the business. Okay. And now data mining. So, um, so data mining is the use of analytical techniques for better understanding patterns and relationships that exist in large data sets. So out of data, you're mining, right? That's, I think that's the name, uh, where the name is coming from. So out of the data, you're mining from the data, and then you're trying to get a better understanding of patterns and, and different things from your data. So some of the things listed here, cluster and sentiment analysis. So data mining is generally predictive um, because like, like the things we will see like regression and different models or classification models, um, you will be able to, you know, apply to new points which are not classified yet. So it's generally predictive model, but there are some techniques within data mining which can be uh, which can fall under descriptive as well, which is, for example, cluster analysis here. Sentiment analysis is basically analyzing text data, for example, Twitter data, right? And then coming up with a um, kind of like a, a scale saying, okay, these tweets, let's say if you're analyzing your product, people tweeting about the product your company is selling. Um, so it, it will be like, okay, you know, you know, these people do like the product and these people do not like the product. And then you might go into further detail with a tweet saying, trying to find out the reasons why people like and why people don't like. And then so this way the company can try to improve itself, right? Okay, now predictive analytics. So these consist of techniques that use models constructed from past data to predict the future or ascertain the impact of one variable on another. So here the idea is you have data collected. These, these algorithms will look at the data, they will learn from the data, and then they will be able to predict uh, new data points as they come in, and then they will try to predict what will happen next, okay? So a very simple example is about housing, housing prices, given the different features of the houses, the location and whatnot, it will learn, okay, you know, on average, what a, um, house will uh, will cost in some certain region with some certain characteristics of the house and then when you query um, let's say you're a realtor and then you want to look at or as a person you want to look at some house at a certain location with I don't know three bedrooms and uh, some square footage and whatnot and then the algorithm will be able to predict saying okay this house will cost you I don't know four hundred thousand dollars why? Because it has seen so many data points with similar characteristics. So it's able to classify your house into some, into some maybe bin, we can, we can define it that way, and then it will give you that price. Now, is that price 100% certain? No, it's not. It can go a little bit up, it can go a little bit down. That's fine. But overall, the goal is to get, get a general picture out of this solution. Okay, um, no predictive model is ever 100% accurate. If you see any model that's 100% accurate, either the data is like, handcrafted like super clean or basically there is something wrong uh, with 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 how the you know how the model was set up because you know 100 percent accuracy is almost um, never achievable under normal circumstances in, in real world the data is always dirty there's always problems there's always outliers there's always different uh, inputs so it's it's almost never achievable to get a hundred percent accuracy Okay, so let's continue. Some techniques used in predictive analytics. Uh, linear regression is one of the most common ones, most famous ones, time series analysis. Data mining is used to find patterns or relationships among elements um, of the, you know, in the large database. Okay, um, so we will see linear regression. Uh, we will also see some more models. So there's like decision trees, logistic regression and, and different models. Um, so we will hopefully see those in the course. Um, time series analysis is really when you have um, so like observations, but each observation is at a certain point in time. Okay, so common example is you know um, is it stock prices here? A very simple example: stock prices. So each day, each hour, or each minute, 
if each second event you can measure what the stock price is of a certain company and you take you can take note of that so the stock price is evolving through time right all right and finally the prescriptive analytics is is basically taking all this information and then indicates a best course of action to take okay so provide a forecast or prediction um So, as I said, a forecast or prediction when combined with a rule becomes a prescriptive model. Okay, so you make a prediction. So, you know, the company makes some predictions, but then it has rules as well after that. So, for example, it might find, okay, this market will be um, quite good to get into, but maybe the company has set some rules that it will not expand into, I don't know, let's say the California area. Although the model can find California to be very profitable, the company might still reject it because based on the rule, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not applicable to that company. Maybe it will stay only in the New York area, for example. Prescriptive models that rely on a rule or set of rules are often referred to as rule-based models. So rules like this, um, if they are being applied, these are called the rules, um, rule-based models. So some more examples here, so portfolio models in finance, right? So they, they use historical investment return data to determine the mix of investments that yield the highest expected return while controlling or limiting exposure to risk. So again, the risk term here is especially valid in finance, right? Um, highest expected return. So they want to get high returns, but also they want to minimize the risk. Okay, so prescriptive, prescriptive models are being used in these scenarios and we will look into a bit of this like in how to use simulation or or optimization models supply network design models um, provide the cost minimizing plant and distribution center locations subject to meeting the customer service requirements okay so in supply chain um right um, there is the location of plants or factories and the distribution centers and then there's a the location of the customers the end customer so how do you spread your distribution centers and factories so that you can minimize the cost and also increase your profit as much as possible, right? Um, so this is, um, um, optimization is being used quite a lot in, in these situations. And, and some more models here. So, so optimization models are the models that give the best decision, okay? Subject to constraints of the situation. Again, the constraints are important here because you're not allowed, you cannot do everything you want as a company. So budget is certainly a big constraint there, for example. Um, I mean, you can have only one distribution center, for example, for the whole US, that might decrease your distribution center cost, but then your transportation cost will increase quite a lot. So when you have two distribution centers, you, have, you will have more distribution center cost, but your transportation cost will decrease. So considering all this together, um, all fall under optimization and prescriptive modeling. And now, um, finally, so there is this simulation, as I, as I mentioned. So this is especially used in analyzing like the probabilistic outcomes um, and to assess the risk of, of a certain good. Um, decision analysis, that's also an another important thing. So it's used to develop an optimal strategy when a decision maker is faced with several decision alternatives in an uncertain set of future events, okay? So decision analysis really uses um, the things we mentioned before, but also um, it employs the utility theory, so which assigns values to outcomes based on the decision maker's attitude towards the risk, loss, and other factors. All right, so um, that's decision analysis there. Okay, so let's touch very quickly on big data. You see those v words starting all with V here. So this is called four Vs of the big data, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So let's see what those are. So big data, um, any set of data that is too large or too complex to be handled by standard data processing techniques and typical desktop software. Okay. So when something is really big, like it's if it is bigger than your own computer, then that's big data for you. So big data is a bit subjective. Okay. I might have a computer with 100 terabytes. Um, for me, that data is not really big. 
you might have a computer of only let's say one terabyte and that data whatever it is can be uh, big data for you so it's the same thing okay for for companies as well there's very large companies like google facebook and whatnot but there are also very small companies and each has a different perspective on big data um so the, the, these words that start with v are uh, they were defined by ibm and it describes the uh, the four V's of uh, of big data. So volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So volume, okay, um, refers to how big the data is. So, ter you know, terabytes of or exabytes of existing data to process. So when you have, you know, a lot of data um, that doesn't really fall into a traditional um, size, then that's that's big data there, the volume of big data. Velocity is uh, the speed of new data coming in, so streaming data. So, for example, um, self-driving cars, um, they they probably get hundreds of megabytes per millisecond of data in, and maybe gigabytes. Probably, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, gigabytes of data per second, because they have they certainly they constantly have to analyze their surroundings through lidar, radar, camera, all different you know kind of. Um, um, scanners and, and sensors, so a lot of data is coming in. So that's velocity there, you know, very quickly a lot of data is coming in. Um, variety means different forms of data together, so there's text, multimedia, video data, um, structured, unstructured data, so all those things coming in together, um, sound data, and, you know, to analyze them, so that's another V of big data. Veracity is um, the uncertain um, uncertainty due to data inconsistency and incompleteness, ambiguities, latency, deception, model approximation. So basically, um, uncertainty and some possibility of erroneous data coming in, in 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 big data. Okay, so these things are explained here again. I will skip over them. Um, so big data. You cannot really deal with big data in the traditional with the traditional things we know. So Microsoft Excel or other um, like coding environments, like I use R and Python a lot. Or you cannot really use those um, in a, is at least in a traditional form. Okay, um, so you have to have different interfaces, different ways of dealing with them. So Hadoop is one of them. MapReduce is another way of um, dealing with big data. And there's Spark, and there's other ways of dealing with big data as well. But again, since if once data becomes really too large, it's really hard to deal with it. So many of the models are not applicable anymore. The traditional uh, way of you know working with them is also not applicable with with big data. But they do represent a lot of opportunities, right? For big companies, if they are able to handle and analyze the data, they will for sure learn a lot. From their customers from their processes and so they can improve their sales themselves okay so a few more things being mentioned here so i see the term data scientist so um data scientist is the person really who can um leverage all the coding knowledge and the statistical knowledge he has he or she has to be able to analyze large amounts of data okay it's not necessarily related to big data um, you know data scientists can can and will deal with with small data as well um, and business analytics in in practice so there are many areas that business analytics is being used financial area the human resource analytics marketing analytics healthcare analytics supply chain analytics sports web analytics for government and profits are very few examples being mentioned here so um, in this figure we can see the degree of complexity okay and the competitive advantage being gained from this. So you see the descriptive here. So um, in terms of advantages at the lower level, then you get more by going to the predictive analytics phase and prescriptive will give you the best um, uh, best advantage. But also when you go up in this, the degree of complexity also increases, right? So in descriptive level, we have standard reporting, visualization, descriptive statistics and whatnot. During predictive, we have data mining, forecasting, predictive modeling, machine learning. And in prescriptive modeling, now we are talking about optimization, decision analysis, simulation, rule-based models, and whatnot. Okay, 
So those examples are being um, explained here, like financial analytics, um, human resource analytics, marketing, healthcare analytics, supply chain, analytics for government and nonprofit, or web and so. So I will not go into detail. You can look over them yourself. Um, just to briefly talk about legal and ethical issues in the use of um, data and analytics. So, so ethical concerns are, are really important in data because, you know, there's data privacy and by making use of data and, and, the, and the algorithms in a not very ethical way, we can really um, affect people's lives, right? So companies have an obligation to protect the data and not to misuse that data. Okay, so, so in, in the data privacy, um, general data protection um, is being uh, protected uh, in European Union by different laws. In US, there's different laws about that. Um, so the request for consent to use an individual's data must be easily understood and accessible the intended use of data must be specified so the company cannot take your data saying they will do one thing but they will end up doing many more things so that's not very ethical must be easy to withdraw the consent the individual has a right to a copy of their right and right to demand their data to be erased so i'm not sure whether us is at this level now but there are more laws in european union about these so when you look at the analytic professionals, we have a responsibility, okay, to behave ethically. So, um, for example, during the summertime, we, um, I and a group of uh, other researchers at the poll, we have analyzed um, people in Chicago who had a, a COVID test. Uh, many of them were missing their um, ethnicity information. So based on their different attributes, we try to come up with their ethnicity because that information is important to see whether, um, you know, whether some ethnicities have, uh, are more prone to getting um, um, this illness or, or and, and things like that. So, and there was a lot of information in that data, but for example, we did not even download that data to our computers. We had to achieve, um, get it. Um, not get it. We had to be connecting to um, our work computer and then analyze it and get the data um, on a server. Okay, so the data was always on the server and all that because we did not want that data, you know, um, to go somewhere. Uh, it's it's sensitive information at the end. So we have to behave ethically. Okay, so um, we had to sign documents for that and everything because um, you know people's data are there. And we don't have the right to just get the data and, and do whatever we want with them. We only did what we were supposed to do and we left it there. We didn't touch it anymore. So, I'm, you know, the example I gave is about protecting the data, being transparent about the data, how it was collected, what it does and uh, does or does not contain. Analysts must be transparent about the methods used to analyze the data and any assumptions that have to be made from the methods used. Okay, so this is another thing. So this is especially valid if, you know, if um, in, in banking and loans and that sort of things, because if the data is directly making use of the person's house address, or, right? Um, now in, in certain, for example, zip codes, um, there might be more people from certain um, ethnic group living there. Now, if the algorithm has some bias for that, now the algorithm won't have bias but through the training process from past data it will gain that bias okay it will gain that bias it, it sounds like a human thing but it, it it learns from the data and if your data is biased you know the algorithm will become biased as well so at the end you, you know that that um that knowledge that the computer that the algorithm has learned from before now it might be used against that person why because he or she is living in that certain zip code and he or she might get denied just because of that right although there is no real connection between that person um and, and to another thing all the other 
check marks might be good so his income might be good and anything else might be good but just because of the zip code why actually it's not because of the zip code it's because of the zip code being tied to another information which may or may not be revealed to that person okay all right and there are some certain guidelines uh, set forth by the different organizations like american statistical association and the operation research and management science the informs association they um they talk about um, ethics and they they provide some ethical guidelines for analysts so the guidelines state that good statistical practice is fundamentally based on transparent assumptions transparent reproducible results and valid interpretations oh sorry about those lines there okay so we have reached the end um and I hope it was useful for you and see you later. Bye-bye.